Okay. Anger. Okay, so what, what's interesting here is you, um, you actually run an organization that deals with a lot of the poor in, uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Is, is that correct? Yeah, so it, how does this... Oh, it's, yeah. Okay, but the home base is in, the, in that yeah, area? Uh, well, it, uh, the home base is in L.A., but we have ministry sites throughout the San Francisco Bay Area where okay. I live. So how does that, what we were just talking about, you know, the, 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 uh, the governmental structure, how does that affect you and the outcome of that? How will that affect, you know, what you're doing, what, you know, what your hope is for that next generation? Yeah, I don't, for, for what we're about, uh, to, to a degree, I, I don't know if it matters who, who the next president is in the United States, uh, because I don't think either of the two major political parties see, uh, I mean, I think they, they, they are trying to have a message to the church, but I don't know if either of the major parties right now believe the church is the frontline vehicle through which social challenges and ills can be solved through spiritual transformation. Um, so I just think that just like in, in the Bible days, the first century church had to be a reflection of the kingdom of God mm. in the midst of oppression, right, opposition, right, right, right. Yeah. in the midst of, of, of a crazy uh, political system and structure. And I think that that's where we are in the United States of America. The church is going to have to really dig in deep into what does it mean to be an extension of God's grace, God's love, God's truth, God's justice in the midst of opposition, uh, division, dysfunction, uh, you know, brokenness. Yeah. And, and, and when you're ministering to the poor yeah. like we are, well, that's how it is all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we're yeah, always, that. when you're ministering to the poor and the marginalized and the broken, you're always doing that in the face of opposition and dysfunction and challenge. And, uh, and so I, I always say, if you can, if you can be fruitful uh, in ministry in, in the most under-resourced urban communities in America and beyond, you can be fruitful for the kingdom anywhere. Yeah, it makes sense. You, um... You talked about the role of the church uh, with, with the poor and the oppressed. Um, and then we talked a little bit uh, uh, about the church needing to step up and, and really come to some sort of a, maybe awakening might be the better term. Um, we, we hear a lot lately this term revival. What, what does that, that mean, mean to you? You know, revival for me is about, um, on one hand, it's about an opportunity to really go back to what is really the, uh, the foundation of what the church uh, can be, mm. should be. Because when you think about reviving something or revival, it's almost like, you, I mean, I start thinking about when somebody is alive and you think they're dead and they need to be revived or, you know, they're close to death yeah. and you need, rev and so on one hand, revival is an opportunity to look back and say, here are some glimpses of when the church was at its best, when evangelism, when discipleship, when mission was at its best, transformative. Uh, and how can we reflect on that so that we can have an even greater vision for what the future of the church can be? Because ultimately, the revival is not about just looking back. It's about looking forward and believing for greater fruit, for greater things than we've experienced before. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, you mentioned earlier that you actually went to school for, uh, for theater, arts, yes. and, and that whole deal. And now you end up CEO of this, this, this amazing company that's, you know, hitting the heart of, you know, God, you know, with the poor and, and, and the disenfranchised and the misplaced. And you're also an author. So how, how, I would say that, you know, um, you definitely found your calling. But what's the process there? How did that, how did that all come about? Well, I mean, for me, uh, I've, I've seen myself as an artist, uh, as, as, a, as one who wants to be in a creative process. Okay. And, and I learned a lot from theater arts about that. Uh, and so my, my struggle or wrestling with my call was within the institution of the church, within the structure 
of church. Could I be an artist? Oh, Could I be a, uh, an innovator? Mm -hmm. Could I be an architect of something? Mm -hmm. And I think some people actually, uh, when, when, they go, when they go into the church as we know it structurally, they actually um, hit a wall. I, I, I've met pastors over the years that, that have instincts similar to mine, that have passions similar to mine, that the church actually becomes the place that breaks them. Uh, and, and they don't achieve uh, the realization of their call. I, I've been fortunate that even though I, I've been inside the walls of the church or I've been in within the structure or the bubble yeah, of yeah. the church, there, there were secret agents <laughs> that were cheering me on and whispering in my ear, well don't said. stop, don't yeah, give up. Good man. Don't, you know. And, and there good were man. times though, when, when I would preach a sermon and, and somebody would come up to me and go, you know, you have so much potential. If you'd stop with all the stories and the jokes and you know, all the, all the metaphors and everything, you could be such a great preacher. Uh, instead of, uh, you know, seeing that if you pull me away from being an artist, you might as well pull me out of the pulpit because yeah. my, my preaching's no good yeah. unless I can use humor and story and, and even um, pain yeah. to, to articulate the gospel narrative. Um, earlier we chatted um, throughout the day and one of the conversations that came up throughout um, some of our other, other, other conversations was the uh, role of pain and suffering in, in the Christian's life versus the role of the prosperity gospel as it's taught. And, and uh, we've experienced both. Where would you find yourself on that scale? Well, you know, as an African American and as a product of the black church in the United States, okay. uh, of course, a, a lot of the ways in which I learned to, to sing uh, worship songs, ways in which I learned to preach or I, I learned to be in community was um, faith in the midst of suffering, right. faith in the midst of being the minority or yeah. the marginalized. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, you know, I, I definitely uh, have, have been shaped by uh, people of faith uh, seeing God do amazing things in the midst of suffering That's and marginalization. Um, at the same time though, I, uh, what I've been able to lean into from my background is, is empowerment, is, is a gospel. I wouldn't say that I'm a prosperity person, right. but I would say that I am a person that believes in empowerment, that when Christ meets the woman at the well, or the person who's diseased or paralyzed, the person that is blind or the person that is arrogant, um, they walk away mobilized, focused, hopeful, uh, strengthened, called. And, and so I, I want to live into that. I, I, I do get concerned uh, in, in my nation that there are too many times when the gospel story gets coupled with um, earthly structures and aspirations yeah. of material gain. Yeah. And I think there's a difference between material prosperity mm -hmm. and supernatural and eternal empowerment. Yeah, I agree. I agree. What's your, when you look at this next generation and we see all the challenges um, that, that are in store for this young adult generation turning into adult, they're our future leaders. Um, what is your hope and what is your prayer for them? Well, I, my, my prayer and hope for this generation is just like in past generations, that even in the midst of deep questioning and wrestling about the church as we know it, yeah. I think that's always been true. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, whether it's Martin Luther yeah, 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 or yeah, John yeah. Wesley or Harriet Tubman, <laughs> uh, there, there have always in every generation been a group of people that questioned the, the current state of the church as they knew it. Yeah. And, they, and they challenged it. Sometimes they were called heretics. Yeah. Uh, some, sometimes they were mistaken for people that had walked away from God. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I feel blessed that I meet many millennials many young adults that even in the midst of their questioning and their frustrations and their wrestling with the church as it is, 
I, I, I'm so glad that I meet people that in their wrestling and frustrations, they haven't stopped dreaming. See, that's good. That's good. And, I, and I think if, if I met a generation that had no imagination, yeah. no dreams, yeah. no vision, no passion, well, then I'm highly concerned about the future of the church on earth. Yeah. But as long as the person that's wrestling, frustrated, and questioning still has dreams, passions, vision, yeah. and imagination, no, well, good. then I'm, I'm going to stay hopeful. Yeah, that's good. Well, listen, it has uh, been a pleasure to chat with you this, this short little while. I look forward to hearing you uh, on the main stage. Uh, Ephraim, thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, bro. Honored to be here. That's fantastic. Fluid 2016, Ephraim Smith. Thanks, guys. We'll catch you later.